showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again, over the hills and the valleys, sun of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drop from us for falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as you God we're confessing, now as our Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops from us for falling, but for the showers we need. This morning's call to worship is found in the Bible. <laughs> Starting off the Romans 11, chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who have first given to him, it shall and, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. Amen. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray to Heavenly Father, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you in, in church this morning, Lord. God is. We look at it and examine our lives and where we're right with things and where we're wrong with things. Lord, I pray that we find where we uh, have opportunities to turn around and worship you and refocus on you. Thank you for this blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All four, we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now God Hallelujah, thy the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory, revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of life, who has shown us a Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. Revive us again, fill each one with thy love. Each soul be rekindled with thy love. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. First.
first, second, and last, we... Sorry, I had the wrong song. There we go. <laughs> Alright, let's try that again. First, second, and last. There's a call called Great York, the restless waves in the light. Send the light. There are souls to rest, there are souls to stay. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed God's for right. Let it shine. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we pray. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel right. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel right. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of God. Send the light, send the light. Let us stand the truth for a prayer. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. All right, now for the song I was trying to sing. <laughs> We, oh, I'm sorry, all four. The joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves. On the tears, our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Now the sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Jeff, would you pray for us?
us to uh, understand your word today. Amen. And uh, we enjoy being with your people and singing these songs and just everything we do. First, second, last. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, slash them in pain from sin and the grave. Reach for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell him what Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue. 
Please stand for our last song today. We'll be singing first, second, and last.
got the alley. That's the thing. Standing from the word of God, we got the alley. Couple things. Um, <laughs> that's why I don't get invited to go speak at a lot of churches. Um, number one, you might be like, "That's horrendous." That we need to be serious. Um, you know, God's word says, "A merry heart doeth good like a medicine." And um, the other thing I find is, um, uh, now we are going to talk about this subject seriously. However, uh, oh, I see what I did there. Uh, let me let me give you a couple of disclaimers. All right, number one, um, Christians act act like the Book of Song of Solomon is pornographic. You know, and I'm I'm being serious with you on what I'm about to say. You know who I find? Uh, uh, now this doesn't always hold true, but it does for the most part. You know who I find has the most problems with 
this book, those that, those that have corrupted God's purpose and design of sex. I'm talking about people that are in pornography. Uh, now, it's possible that they've been abused. That's a possibility. But a lot of the times, I find it's those that are doing things they shouldn't be doing. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, anywho, uh, number two, let me give you my disclaimer. I didn't know if I was, but I, I feel I, I should. Um, I'll do my best to handle this discreetly and good. However, let me say this. If you think, if, if you're not happy and you want to come and blah, blah, blah to me when we're done, I will, I'm not kidding, I will give you the floor and you can have a shot at it, okay? And, uh, and we'll judge you. So um, uh, I'm, I'm actually being dead serious because, uh, um, anyway, we'll, we'll find out. All right, and I, one more thing, let me say this. Um, I, you know, honestly, well, first off, it's in the Bible, which means God sanctions this book. Um, number two, um, honestly, when you think about it, it's quite needed for our society. And, and you'll see that when I go along. The reason is, think about this. The, the, um, what is, what is, uh, I'll just say it and the Lord will sort it out. What is one of the issues or the problems of today, right? Well, it's sex, sex, sex everywhere, right? However, there is a narrative. The world has a narrative, but God's Word has a narrative. And I've never understood this, this abortion, okay? Yes, I get it. I, I get it. They say the issue, they, they say the fight is, well, is it a human life? Is it a human life? And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I understand that concept. But how come as Christians, we are not extolling the virtues of marriage? I, I've never understood it, okay? We're, we're fighting this one battle, and that's fine. We need to fight that battle. But we're not fighting the whole battle. What should we be pumping out to young people? We should say, hey, sex is good. God, God ordained it. It's okay in the right context, which is what? Marriage. Marriage, marriage. Why aren't we pumping that out? I don't understand that. And but Song of Solomon, what you see in Song of Solomon is, is you see uh, 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 the Shumalite was faithful to Solomon. Okay, and she was a virgin when she got married. You know, when I was a kid, I've never understood this either. There's two things they didn't talk about. Dulce didn't talk about when I was a kid. You never talked about HIV. It was like a horrible thing to talk about. And the other thing. Uh, you never use the word virgin. Can I tell you, you know, this might come as a shocker, Mary was a virgin. <gasps> what? What a shocker. Um, uh, it's not a bad thing. Why do we make it a bad thing? Only in the West, or I mean, this may be, uh, uh, this may not be a true statement, but it's a partial true statement, if nothing else. Only in the West are, are Christians uh, I don't even know what word to use. I almost want to use prudish, but that might sound rude. Uh, they're, they're just bothered by it. Well, if you're married and you have kids, can I tell you? Uh, you've had sex, okay? Now, the, now, I will say this. I could make an argument that the word sex is a crude word. Now, you could say that, all right? And so, I get it. You could use other words, and we will. Oh, by the way, one more thing. This is for Caleb's benefit. Because he asked me this yesterday, and after Caleb did, I thought, oh, you know what? That means if, if Caleb doesn't understand, that means the kids aren't going to understand. Um, you're going to hear me use the word consummate, okay? Caleb's like, oh, what does that mean? They had sex, okay? All right, here we go. Um, first off, <laughs> I totally agree with Spurgeon. <coughs> Spurgeon said, he's talking about the Song of Solomon, it is a book of deep mystery not to be understood except by the initiated. This book stands like the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and no one will ever be able to pluck its fruit and eat of it until one has been brought by Christ past the, past the sword of the cherubim and led to rejoice in the love that has delivered him from death. 
you know, you know, Spurgeon here, it almost sounds like he's talking like Shakespeare, right? It's like Spurgeon. What are you trying to say? I got a translate button. <laughs> this book is hard to understand. Uh, you got to understand a couple of things. There's so much here. Unfortunately, you have to do math to understand it. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> we're going to do a little math, but I'm not going to give you all the verses to do the math. If you want to, if you want it, you're going to have to dig that out. Okay. Um, there's going to be a lot of bonus content. Uh, there's going to be. Uh, uh, I gave y'all an outline. That outline will be in the bonus content. There'll be two other outlines in the bonus content. <coughs> the reason I printed this one out for you guys today is you remember in, in Esther, we talked about a, a chiastic structure. You say, no, I don't remember that. Um, but we talked about where, it, you know, everything, it, it, everything's going one way and then it flips. OK, well, we see a, a chiastic structure here as well, and it, it builds to the middle of the book. Um, there's also another structure. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna explain that to you, but, uh, there's another structure. And, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting how it is and how it works out. <coughs> but the reason this is a hard book, well, one of the reasons is people say, uh, there, there's a lot, if, if we were going to spend time, like if we, and I almost gave this two weeks. Um, and the other reason I almost gave it two weeks is I didn't have it figured out. Okay, that's how complicated it is. And then I was like, oh, I figured it out. I figured it out. And so, um, so it's only gets, it only has one week. So you adults are are happy. Oh, I forgot to tell you, all the adults are dreading today, and all the kids are like, oh, I'm excited. <laughs> um, sorry, kids, I should make you leave the room. You're supposed to be 30 years or older. I'm just kidding. Um, People say it is impossible, it is impossible that Solomon can teach us about faithful love. He was a scoundrel, sort of, okay? This is where you got to do some of the math. Guess what? He, he had two wives, and I'm gonna, we're going to talk about them in a minute, okay? And he was faithful to those two wives. Uh, the, the first one that we're going to talk about probably died before he married the second one. And he was faithful to that second wife. It wasn't until he turned 50-ish that he, he started accumulating wives. Why are we, why are we shaking our head? Midlife crisis. I, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I thought the same thing. So he, it wasn't until he turned 50 that he started amassing wives and his heart was turned away, okay? But in his, in the young, in his young life, he was on point, okay? And so you have to remember that. And even if you want to say that, Honestly, I think that could be a point in the book. That could be a key concept that God can can take sinful human beings and use us to show his glory. Doesn't he do that? I mean, listen, if he doesn't, we might as well just sit around and be despondent all day. We, we can't accomplish anything. And that makes God's grace just weak. God's grace isn't weak. But I tell you this, he was faithful. And we're going to see this. So... Um, <coughs> People have their opinions of Solomon, uh, and their their opinions are so poisoned because of the few years of backsliding at the end of his life. And they what they do is they take that and they try to put it here. You can't. This was he was a different person at the beginning. It is inconceivable to them that God would call Solomon and the Shumalite, Shum, Shum, Shulamite, oh beloved ones. But he exactly does that. You see this in Second Samuel. Hey, I think we read that yesterday, didn't we? We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, that's the Lord, okay, talk to Nathan the prophet, and he called his name, talking about Solomon, Jedidiah, because, because of the Lord. So, did you catch that? Who did, who did God love? It was Solomon, okay? And it says, uh, he called his name Jedi because of the, because of the Lord. That, is, that means beloved of the Lord, okay? So, he, he's saying Solomon was beloved of the Lord. Um, that's important to know, okay? We'll come back to that, but, but it's important to know that, all right? That, that'll help us out. Uh... If, well, like I said, if, if we were actually going to be doing this, like if this was a, 
our weekly Sunday school class or whatever, I would I would list every way that this book is supposedly interpreted, and then we would start shooting them down. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're not going to spend all the time to do that. Um, maybe I'll put some content in the bonus. The bonus, we'll, we'll see. But I will say this. Burkhoff, he outlines eight different views of the book, while some commentaries show at least 19 views, and they contradict each other. You see how complicated it can get? Well, uh, I want to tell you this from the start. This is primarily a book on romance, marriage, and sexual love, being a delightful, intoxicating gift from God, and only secondarily being an image of the relationship between Christ and uh, Christ and the church. And let me let me tell you let, let me tell you this. A lot of people, uh, the Christians that are uncomfortable, they allegorize this whole book. Oh, it's just an allegory. It's just an allegory. No, it's not. No, it's not. And um, I'm not going to spend my time to prove that, but uh, but it's not. Uh, uh, the other people, they, they the allegory is well, it's Christ and the church. Um, honestly, m- my opinion is this. Uh, it, it's twofold. Yes. Yes, we can see Christ in here, but I, I don't think it's the way they try to allegorize it. And the reason is, um, you have a it's, a, it's a far stretch to make this talking about Christ in the church. And there's a lot of reasons. Number one, um, and this is an interesting note that I'll give you here in a minute in the slides. Um, this book is not mentioned in the New Testament. You say, well, that's interesting. Why are you telling us that? Because it makes it hard, okay? If Paul would have given us something, it would have helped us, okay? That makes it hard. We don't have any reference, okay? Um, The other thing is, they didn't know about the church in the Old Testament. So for you to say that, it's actually wrong, okay? Um, Okay, now uh, I will say this on the flip side. You have people that come and, and they just say, oh, this is about, about sex and love and blah, blah, blah. And they say, oh, it has nothing to do with Christ. I don't believe that. If it's in God's word, trust me, it's pointing us to Christ in some form. Okay. And I, to me, to me, you say, well, where do you see Christ? To me, it's in the faithfulness. It's in the, it's, it's in, it's in the, the Shumalite, the Shumalite saves herself for her husband. And it's in the husband, um, uh, being faithful to his wife. Uh, by the way, um, after you do the math, you come to the conclusion that Solomon was married to her for 7 to 13 years, and he was faithful to her all those years. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, <clears throat> what do we got here? Uh, oh, yeah, you need to know this. Um, you won't find any crude or vulgar language in this book. You won't find any pornographic craftness like you do in some expositions of this book. Sex is not portrayed as an idol. It's not shunned as an evil thing. Indeed, as the couple experiences and expresses their ecstasy, God speaks his total approval. We're going to see this. Um, That's in chapter 5, verse 1, where the Lord actually is saying, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. And he's talking about them having sex, enjoying one another. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So the very heart and center of this book, God's blessing upon marital love. So what is the key, what is going to be the, one of the key takeaways, honestly, to me in our society, this is the main takeaway. Kids, you can have sex when you get married, okay? And you should tell them. And honestly, I have to tell you, I'm going to deal with some, some stuff, but uh, I think it needs to be talked about. I, I think parents, you need to be talking to your kids, and, and you'll, you'll see why here in a minute, but there are a lot of, wha- I mean, Christians, have a lot of wacky ideas, and they're wrong. They're wrong. They're sinful. <clears throat> okay, look at verse 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. You see where it says the Song of Songs? That's like saying the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. So we're saying it is the best. This is the best of Solomon, uh, of, of his songs, okay? And you say, well, what's the big deal there? Well... You see my little note for me down there? I call that my cheat, um, so I don't forget to tell you guys. But over in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, it says, and this is talking to Solomon, and he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. That's a lot. 
It's a lot. <coughs> well, out of those 1,005, this is the apex. This is his best song. That's what it's saying here, okay? Uh, some people think that Solomon did not write this. They, they want to play they want to play word games. Uh, they want to play word games with this. Um, Y'all know how I feel about that. First off, I say it says what it says. Duh. Um, God doesn't play word games with us, all right? He knows we're dumb. If God's going to make a word, now listen, I get it. You say, well, well, you know, back in the day, gay used to mean happy. Well, no, it doesn't mean that. Satan corrupts things. God doesn't, okay? So, um... Uh, so words are important. Matter of fact, um, you're going to see a word in here where it says uh, it used the word espousals. That just means wedding. Okay, that's what he's talking about there. <coughs> All right, <coughs> some things to note. Uh, Jim, can you bring me a cup of water, please? <coughs> All right. So I've already told you that. Um, it's not mentioned in the New Testament, okay? Uh, I love that it's SOS. I don't know. It's just funny in my head. Uh, could, I could make so many jokes on that. Um, we, we shouldn't, but I might. Oh, no, I'm married. SOS, SOS. Or it's funny in my head. Um, funny in my head. We're, we're, we're taking a little pause while I get a drink of water. All right. I I almost. Oh, I'll show you later on. I'll tell you later on. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I needed that. All right. Orthodox Jews. There's uh, men under thirty were encouraged not to read this book because it might get them going. At the same time, the Jews have counted the book among their most holy ones, and they esteem it and they estimate it very highly. Okay. It's really a a really big thing. Um, <clears throat> it is Oriental poetry. It's marked by special pictorial language. Um, it's f full of love, flowery, sentimental, sometimes very vivid expressions. But I tell you this, an Oriental or a Hebrew would not consider this book a description of voluptuous passion. In other words, it's not filthy. That's only us in our Western minds, okay? Because <clears throat> we've been programmed that way. You say, well, how do we overcome that? Read and believe what God says. Some think the book is describing the, the king's love for a poor shepherd girl. Uh, one version says uh, the girl was already promised to a shepherd and remained faithful to him in spite of the king's urge. Others think the book is a collection of up to 30. That's funny. So they think of their love or wedding poems. In other words, it's not a cohesive book. And they argue over it. Okay, No, it's 17. No, it's 8. No, it's 30. Well, the way we know... The way we know it's not just a bunch of compilation of love poems, it says the Song of Songs. That alone tells you it is one cohesive work, okay? Now, I will, uh, uh, I will tell you this. Uh, before I, I looked at anything, okay, when I read it, and when you read it, you, you might get the idea about the one about, oh, he loves a poor shepherd girl, uh, but she was promised to somebody else. Um, you can get that sense. However, and I did when I when I first read it, just unbiasedly, I thought, "Oh, wait a minute." And then, but there's some holes. Okay, there's there's holes to that, and there's uh, one of the biggest holes is if that was true. Because what they say is they say that she um, she never slept with King Solomon. That he was, and remember, it's because of the bias, right? Because oh, he had so many wives and all this. Well, not at this time. This was written uh, early on in his. Uh, career and so uh, and so what they say is they say that well she was faithful to her true love uh, Wesley <laughs> you know they they tell you in in, in uh, Wesley and Butterclub it's the uh, princess bride you know they they tell you you should not you should not use references to movies because no one's gonna understand them but I don't care all right um, anyway <laughs> My point is, they say that that she was faithful, that she f 
fended off his advances. Um, I will tell you this. You, you read the first chapter. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. And so there's and there's other stuff as well. So so that's not it. It is talking about Solomon and his first love. Okay. <coughs> um, and you're gonna see that here in a minute. Oh, um, the other one. They some think the origin to be found in hymns of the Babylonian cult of Tamuz. Let me just say no. Um, that would be called idolatry. Um, now. Maybe, maybe if you could convince me that this was written after he was 50, okay, but no, there's no way. It's inconceivable. All right, um, for all my literal friends, oh, that is one of the sexiest women I've ever seen in my life. So this is what it would look like, okay? Uh, let's see. How beautiful you are, my darling. Uh, eyes are like doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes. Lips are a scarlet thread. Uh, temples are like a slice of pomegranate. Oh, I know what he's saying. He's saying, oh, I can just eat you up. And so your neck is like a tower. It's my favorite one. Uh, 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 with with rows of stones and, and shields. Oh, your breasts are like two, uh, two um, gazelles. Uh, see, there's the gazelles. And then, oh, uh, this grosses me out. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue. <laughs> uh, the, the fragrance of your garments are like the fragrance of Lebanon. You smell like a tree. And uh, your navel's a round goblet. Your belly is like a heap of wheat. Uh, sweet. Uh, your nose is like the tire of Lebanon, which faces toward Damascus. Uh, some good stuff there. Scott, Corbin, oh. Caleb, you need to get this stuff, okay? When you get married, you can use this stuff, okay? When you get married. I I, I didn't do it, but I, 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 almost, I almost wrote a, I was going to write a Texan, Texan version of this, um, but I didn't. <laughs> it could happen. Um, oh, wait, my wife's English. I have to do an English version of this. <laughs> your nose, Krista, your nose is like the Tower of London. Captivating all of the uh, all of the prisoners. Okay, let's get to the let's get to the good stuff. Um oh I noticed that I noticed Carl's not here. So he must have done what you wanted to do, Debbie, and not show up because you knew it was Song of Solomon. Because I he's off today that I know of. Uh, let's see. All right. All right. Check this out. First Kings. Okay. Where are you at? First Kings. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, check this out. In First Kings chapter 2, verse 39. It says, And it came to pass at the end of three years that two of the servants of Shim, ran, uh, Shimei ran away unto Achish, son of Maka, king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Behold, thy servants be in Gath. Skip down to 3 1. And Solomon made a, uh, affinity, made a league with the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he made an end of building her own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Okay, so he married. Pharaoh's daughter, third year being king, okay? Now, now this isn't who, uh, uh, there's only two people that this, this Song of Solomon can be talking about. Pharaoh's daughter is one, but I don't believe it's her. I believe it's a lady named Namath, and you'll see this in a minute. <coughs> now, you're going to be like, hey, uh, she was a heathen. He shouldn't have married her. Um, uh, I'm not going to explain everything to you, but... I believe she converted, okay? I believe she converted. You say, why do you say that? Because he lets her live in Jerusalem, okay? Now, later on, later on, he kicks her out of Jerusalem because she she um, she turned away, okay, from God. So he, he put her somewhere else, okay? Um, all right, now look at, we're, we're asking the question, who's the book about, okay? 
Second uh, Chronicles chapter 12, verse 13. Um, so King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned, for Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother name, his mother's name was Nama, the Am, uh, an Am, Ammonitess. Okay, again, you got to go do your study. You'll find out that um, you say, "Oh no, they shouldn't have married them. They were bad." Um, you find out that there were some uh, Ammonites uh, that had converted. Um, uh, so, so she was, uh, it seems like she was a believer. Okay. I believe Naaman was his first love. Rehoboam came to the throne. There was no dispute over him coming to the throne. Okay. All right. So now you have to do the math and I'm, I'm not going to give you all the verses how to do the math. We're just going to, I'm just going to blah, 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 tell you so we can move on. If you want to do the math, well, call Susan and. She'll spend uh, two days doing it with you. Okay, so where did I put that thinking cap? Okay, so Solomon was 29. When you do the math, he was 29 when Rehoboam was born. Now, that means that Rehoboam was born one year before he became the king. Okay? You following me? Um... So that so that tells us that he had to he was married to Nama before he was even even king, okay? But wait, there's more. So uh, if that's uh, he was born one year before becoming king, you throw in your nine months, boom, you have two years of marriage, okay? And he's he's not married to anybody else. He's faithful, and um, well. If Rehoboam was 41 years old when he came to the throne, his dad reign was exactly 40 years, which it was, by the way. Uh, simple math tells us that Rehoboam was born at least a year before his father, uh, Solomon, became king. He was born a year before Solomon became king. He had to have been conceived nine months before. That would mean Solomon would have been married two years before he became king. So Solomon was already married at least two years before his father, David, had died. Um, look at First Kings, but wait, there's more. Look at First Kings chapter four. Okay, First Kings chapter four. We're going to look at verse eleven. Let's get down to verse fifteen. The son of Abinadab in all the region of Dor, which had, which had Tephah, the daughter of Solomon, to wife. Skip down to verse fifteen. Ahamazaz was in Naphtali. He also took Basma, the daughter of Solomon, to wife. I have a question. Where, where did um, where did these daughters come from? This was at the beginning of his reign. Where did they come from? I'll tell you where they came from. They were they were Nama's daughters, which actually preceded. They came before um, Rehoboam. Okay, and you say, what's your point? Well, guess what? You do the math, you come out to 7 to 13 years. He had to be married 7 to 13 years, and he was faithful to her. Okay, so uh, I believe that the Song of Solomon was, was written about Nama. Okay, um, all right, let's move on to key concepts. All right, first off, this is a big it's a negative key concept, but it is a key concept nevertheless. It's a big key, big key concept, okay? Man is good at destroying God's original purpose. Man is good at destroying God's original purpose. Um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, okay? Um, now, even though, I will say this, even though the Song of Solomon is not found in the New Testament, it flows with other biblical principles of marriage all throughout the Scripture. Okay? Um, and that is a little helpful for us. Um, all right, so Hebrews 13, 4. 
it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Um, oh, well, here, let me give you this fact right here. Uh, just This is an interesting fact. Polygamy up in, in, in America, there are upwards to 60,000 people practicing it. Really? Public support has more than tripled since 2010. That's one in four people. And, and you know, with, with, with some of the court rulings and, and homosexuality making advance, we're, we're seeing this become more and more acceptable. They're pushing for it. They're not just pushing for that. They're, they're pushing for what, what, is the, what, is the, um, what is their narrative? You know what? Love is love, man. Oh, that's a seven-year-old man. That's okay. You know, we love each other. It's not right. Now, in Hebrews 13, 4, the reason I read that is, I wanted you to see where it says, marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. Uh, the reason I want you to see that is this, and, I, and this is one of the reasons I think it should be talked about at the very least, uh, parents training their kids and talking about it, is because of this. There are Christians, and, and they will, remember, what are we good at? Destroying God's original purpose. Christians love to take God's word and make it say whatever they want it to say or mean. I, I want to say this clearly. So let's see if I can accomplish it. Uh, I'll say it like this. Husbands and wives. You, God sanctions you to endure your husband or your wife. Let me back up. It is the, it is the wife for the husband and the husband for the wife. Okay, there's no, there's no husband, husband, wife, wife. Okay, and we'll clarify that. Uh, God says it is good and you can do that. But, but it does not mean, this is where they corrupt this. Okay, uh, and I'm talking about Christians. Well, you know, a long time ago, uh, I wasn't here for this, but I heard about it. Grace will know about this. Uh, at, at Anchor, there was some wife swapping going on. Um, no. I, I said, these are not the droids you're looking for. Um, no, I don't know what I said, but I said, I don't know what I said. That, oh, I wasn't here for this. I wasn't here for this. But, but Grace will remember, there was wife swapping going on. It was a big deal in the church, okay? Um, uh, Andrew was, huh? No, no, no. It was anchor. When my, when my father-in-law, when my father-in-law came and it was prominent people in the church, by the way, not my father-in-law, but he had to deal with that, deal with it. Um, Andrew was telling me, you know what? They might've been a part of it. Uh, uh, there was a lot of swinging going over in Boykin. If you don't know what that is, that's exactly what I just described. Okay. Swap them up. And listen, it doesn't mean that. Okay, when it says the marriage bed is undefiled, no. It means you can sleep with your wife, you can sleep with your husband, you can enjoy each other. That's it. You don't get to enjoy someone else's husband, you don't get to enjoy someone else's wife. You understand? And, and, and the other thing is this. Um, usually I find this is the guy. Now, I say usually because, you know, things are changing in our culture. Um, and the wife usually just goes along with it. Um, uh, no. Because you're married, and it says the marriage bed is undefiled, you don't get to introduce pornography into your relationship. You should be watching pornography together. Uh, you shouldn't be watching it alone, okay? No, that's not what that's telling you, okay? Uh, you say, man, Pastor, why are you trying to be so precise? You know why? Because of foolish people, they'll take what I say and they'll twist it. for their. Because, you know, we're good at destroying God's original purpose. Um, and so, no, you should not be having pornography. You shouldn't be having other people. Uh, men, men, we protect our wives. You know what that means? That means we would never, we would never say to them, "Hey, let's have this other guy come over." You know what? I don't know about you, but I'm jealous. I mean, I'm, a je I'm jealous. God's jealous. I can be jealous. It's like, hey, you back off. Get your own wife. Okay. Um, and so, but but these things that I'm telling you right now, they happen. And and I and, and it damages your marriage, uh, damages your wife. It is horrendous. It's a big deal. Uh, 
right, we're gonna look at this in a minute. One more, one more thing. Well, we got to look at some other stuff here, but uh, wait, did I? Where is it? Where is it? I'm, I'm skipping. Hold on. Oh, where is it? Oh, I see what I, I see what I've done there. Okay. <clears throat> so let me tell you this. Um, so the Song of Solomon. It is a it is a picture of a marriage feast or festival, if you will, and it lasts seven days. The Jewish last seven days, and so um, I'm giving you the breakdown. Something that's interesting here. I don't know if I was going to tell y'all, but uh, but I figure it'll make Debbie Huffman uncomfortable, so I might as well say it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. I yeah. You know how to you know how to run people off from your church, preach on Song of Solomon. Uh or well preach on it right. But anyway, this is an interesting thing of the book. This is something interesting, okay? Um you actually find you actually find that the lady uh, institutes romance more than the guy. It's interesting, okay? You you know, uh, women are like, oh, man, guys are pigs, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? Say what you want, ladies, but she's like revving it up, just letting you know. And so, um, all right, so what you have is you have, you have seven days of a wedding, and then at the end they go, they go visit... Um, uh, friends or family. I personally think it's family they visit, um, but we'll we'll see. It doesn't matter. But they visit somebody. Um, uh, let's read just a little bit. We're not going to be. We're not going to look at. We're going to. We're going to skip around a little bit on the seven days because I have some other key concepts I want to get to. <clears throat> but let's listen to this. The song of songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Oh, oh, oh! By the way. One of the one of the um, uh, 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 things is they say well uh, uh, one of the interpretations is that there are three segments <coughs> to this book and in our Western mind we would really like it to be that way okay which is it is it is before they're married then they're married and then they have a lasting relationship okay um, now. I mean, if you want to use it that way, you can, but you got a big problem, all right? And it's it comes in chapter one. Um, as, when we when we get there, I'll tell you, they consummated the marriage. Um, but it says, "Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine." Um, they wouldn't be talking like that if this was in the betrothal stage, okay? Um, that wouldn't be allowed. Um, so what we're what we're seeing here is they're they're at the um, they're at the banquet. Okay, this is before the the marriage and the consummation. And listen to what it says: Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee? So we'll see this. We'll see. We'll see. There's other people there. We'll see the daughters of Jerusalem. So it's the wedding feast. Her family's there. Uh, some sometimes. Sometimes uh, the Shumalite will um, will initiate things, but other times she she lets Solomon know, "Hey, I want you to chase me." Okay, so um, draw me. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We brought me into his chambers. Well, that's not betrothal right there, is it? We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. She says, I am black but comely, O you daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me, and they made me, they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So uh, I find this interesting and very telling. Every lady, you ought to be able to, except for Susan, because you know she's so confident in herself. But every other lady, you are, um, you have no, uh, that's sarcasm. Well, I don't know about them, but I know you're a woman, so you automatically have issues. Uh, I'm not being rude. I'm being serious. I mean, come on, ladies. 
You look in the mirror and you're like, oh, look at my nose. I don't like my nose. Oh, look at my lips. Is this dress making me look fat? How's my hair? Oh, what about my eyes? Okay. But here's the great thing, okay? She feels the same way. Lady, every single woman feels the same way, unless they're a jerk, okay? <laughs> and if they're a jerk, and if they're a jerk, Honestly, they're probably more insecure than you are. Okay, can I tell you? But what happens is, what do you have here? Uh, what we see is, basically, Solomon tells her, no, man, you're hot. Okay, and he says, you're beautiful. And he, and he describes her in, in this disgusting imagery. Uh, um, but back in the day, hey, that was a thing. And so he let, he's let, and, and as a matter of fact, there comes a part where, uh, and we'll see this, um, there's everybody thinks he talks about a harem. He's not talking about his. He's talking about uh, well, who knows? It's whoever came to the wedding, and he's he's ba he basically tells her this man. You see all these ladies, they're you're nothing compared to them. You are better than all of them, and he he only has eyes for her. It, it's pretty it's pretty sweet. Um. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, something else that is interesting is uh, m most people well, you know what, honestly, yeah. When I, most people, ladies, uh, ladies and men, uh, be because ladies think men are pigs, they would think <laughs> Uh, and, and men would think this as well. Most people think um, sex is all about the being naked. Okay, no, you do not see that in Song of Solomon. You see, he talks about the, there's they talk about perfume and there's they talk about clothes and they they talk about jewelry and then there's there's an image of Solomon and he's arrayed in, in all his glory as well. And so and so. It's not just about the nakedness, okay? Um, it's okay. Put a little perfume on, people. It's okay. You can put some uh, put some shields on your neck to make it look like a tower. Um, he says, "Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels; thy neck with chains of gold." Um, <laughs> in verse nine, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. One of the uh, one of the things that I struggle with in this book is who's talking, okay? I'm going to give you an outline where you can, and honestly, if you're going to read it, you should have the outline in front of you, and you can be like, oh, that's who's talking, and it makes sense, okay? But Because there's a lot of back and forth, and, and, and I, I got to really think, all right, which one's talking now? Um, uh, okay, in verse 13, uh, well, first off, we see it in verse 12. While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. So they're at the banquet, right? She, she smells good, right? She's, she's like, oh, enticing. And so look at verse 13. A bundle of myrrh is my well, a bundle of myrrh is my well beloved unto me. He shall lie at night betwixt my breast. So they would, they would take like a sachet or, or something and they would, the lady would put it between her breasts and have it there all day, okay? And so, and then the implication is, well, it tells you, he shall lie all night betwixt my breast, okay? Um, my beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. Um, I'm, missing, I'm missing a verse. Where was it? Maybe it's in chapter 2. It has to be in chapter 2. Um Um, well, it'll, it'll come to me. Okay. It'll come to me. So day one goes through verse seven. Okay. Um, they consummate the, the marriage in verse one. It says, I'm the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. People want to equate this to Jesus. It's not, sorry. It's not, um, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters as the apple tree among the trees of the wood. So is my beloved among the sons. Man, doesn't that just make you hungry? It's like, how would we put this today? You are the bacon. Oh, wait, that's pork. The Jews would never say that. You are the hamburger among the animals. Okay. 
Um, he brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Um, stay with me, flagons. Come for me with apples, for I am sick of love. Oh, oh, this is the verse right here. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. Um, this is a Hebrew way. Well, first off, the Hebrew picture is he is on top of her, and and he is fondling her. So I don't think this is the betrothal stage, okay? They've had the wedding feast. Now they're consummating the marriage. Um, in verse 7, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem. So she's talking to her, her friends, okay? Um, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor wake my love till he please. He's tell she's telling them, uh, I'm going to translate it into the way we would say it today. Um, hey, don't have sex till you're married. Okay, um, that's pretty much what she's saying there. And she says it a couple of times. Um, they go to day two. Um, he he's he comes. He's coming to the. He's coming to the. Uh, verse nine. My beloved is like a row. Well, let's start in verse eight. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. So he's coming back to the bridal chamber. He sees her. They, they, um, in verse 10, he says, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so they go have a walk in the garden. Um, and, and you see that. And then... Uh, I... I haven't, okay, so a lot of people, uh, they think that, that her, in verse 15, take up the fox, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, for our vines have tender grapes. Um, a lot of people think that's her family, her brother's messing with her. I don't know. Um, I'd have to soak on it. And, and they say, well, she doesn't care. She's like, my beloved is mine, I'm his. He feedeth among the lilies. Um, oh, so they go... Um, when you read day two, oh, I forgot to tell y'all. Every day, every day of the wedding, it consummates with them having sex. Okay, and seven days, and then um, here, here they actually have sex in the garden because um, they they run away and go hide or whatever. Um, okay, there's a dream sequence on right here. Uh, whoops, on day three. Okay. Um, by night on, on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. And so, so there's dream sequence, and, and she's, she's concerned. You know, she can't, she can't find him. And then she wakes up, and uh, she wakes up, and, and he's there. And uh, Then you have day four, um, where he, he describes her. You know, flock of sheep, blah, 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 pomegranate. My neck is like a tire of David. Build it for an armory. Oh, man, I tell you, it just stirs me. Uh, um, in verse 7, he says, Thou art my all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Uh, later on, she talks about, she talks about, uh, uh, um, in, in the first part of the book, she talks about being a wall. She, what she's talking about there is she... Um, oh, we're actually to the climax of the book, chapter 5. She actually... Um, she's saying, I have been pure. Okay? She said, I've been pure. And so what you, what you see here is um, in verse 12 of chapter 4, a garden enclosed is my sister, and my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So she's saying, I have been pure. And, and then, look at verse 15. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. She says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. What, what, what we see here is, well, look at verse 1, and then we'll put it together. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink. Yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. So what you have a couple of things here. She's inviting him. Okay. So when, when they get married, she gives herself totally to her husband. And he takes her. 
Okay, that's what you see in verse 1 of chapter 5. And so, and then, you see where it says, Oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. This is the Lord speaking, okay? I'm not going to go and build up the case for it. Um, you can you can study it, but but God is, is sanctioning this, and he's telling them it's okay, this is good. This is good. And so, you have you have uh, you have day six. Um, w- when you go into day six, the, there's another. Oh, did I skip day five? Yeah. Stand by. Oh, okay, yeah. Day when you go into day five, uh, there's another dream sequence. Um, and then you go to day six, day seven. Um, okay, I'm I'm skipping those days because I wanna I wanna I want I want my key concepts. Um, tell me when you're done. Uh, I will say this in, in chapter five. Um, what? So, so you think, oh, the the guy he describes her, but she describes him. And as a matter of fact, um, in verse nine, she says, "What is thy beloved more than another beloved?" Oh, th- this is the daughters of Jerusalem. It, it, she couldn't find him. Uh, she couldn't find him because uh, this is part of the dream sequence. Um, and if you don't believe it's a dream dream sequence, that's fine. Then, um, but but there's elements that make it seem like it is. But anyway, he comes to her door. She's uh, so it's either a dream or she, it says I sleep, but my heart wakes. So that's why I say it's a dream sequence. But um, her beloved knocks on the door. Um, she's like, "Hey, it's funny because I can hear women saying this. I've just put off my coat. I I'm ready for bed." I, you know, um, but then it says, uh, my bowels were moved for him. So she's finally got stirred up. Well, by the time she got there, he left. She goes looking for him. And um, the daughters of Jerusalem are like, hey, why, why is he, why, 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 why should we help you or whatever? And, and then she describes him. My beloved is white and Rudy and the chiefest among 10,000. And, and she does this a couple of times. She describes him. And and that uh, causes her to have a desire for him. Did you get that one? Okay. Key concept. In God's context, intimacy is good. Okay. The key being in God's context. Do not, do not, and listen, all the stuff about polygamy and the pornography and all that, I think there needs to be some conversations. And I, for, for, for guys, um, for guys like uh, Caleb, Corbin, uh, uh, Scott. Scott, middle child Scott, um, who did I miss? Logan. I, I think there should be some uh, the the conversations. Listen, the conversations are not don't have to be crude, and they don't have to be done in mixed company. But I think there should be some conversations, and it should be this: uh, the conversation for the guy should be, "Hey, how you, how do you treat how do you treat a lady?" Okay. Um, the conversations the conversations for the girl should be, "Hey, do you want?" Um, I'm sure there's a better way to say this, but huh, do you want other guys lusting after you? I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not saying that to the ladies at all. What I'm saying is, don't you think your husband, he's the one who wants to look upon you? He doesn't want any, if he's a good husband, I would think he wouldn't want anyone else gazing upon you in that way. And you say, well, that just sounds horrible. Well, then lady, don't get married. Um, it doesn't make sense. Do you... Do you, oh, here, let's flip it. Ladies, are you okay with other ladies being like, mm, look at Andrew. Oh, need some of that meat over there. Mm. That'd make you feel good. If you're a, if you're a good lady, 
you want to gouge their eyes out, okay? <laughs> so, so understand what I'm saying. And, I, and the reason I think that this should be a conversation, I, I, I find, and I, I finally figured it out in my head, ladies. I've always wondered, I thought, how come ladies don't understand the power they have over men? I finally figured it out. It's because the ladies don't think they have power. They they think that they are are lower than dirt. It totally makes sense. And so, um, but the other thing that should be done is is men should talk to their sons about, hey, we we treat ladies with respect, and what does that mean? Okay. Um, but also in the conversation, you're hitting it over and over again. Guess what? The world's hitting over and over again. Have sex, have sex, have sex, have sex. Christians are like, oh, we can't talk about that. No, you know what we ought to be saying? You can have sex when you get married, when you get married, when you get married. You know what would happen? <gasps> Guess what would happen? That would solve half the abortion crisis right there, wouldn't it? And you say, well, what about, what if they're raped or what are they this? I have solutions for that. I say we enact Old Testament law. I'm not kidding. Um, you kill the person. If, if they are convicted of rape, they are put to death. And I get it. Then you have the other ones who say, well, well, what if they're what if they were innocent? Well, first off, and because you I get it, you say, well, what if you got accused of it and were, were innocent and, and put to death? Well, you better be right with the Lord and the Lord will sort it out. I'm not kidding. I'm not saying it's a perfect system in a fallen world, but there are answers. And one of the answers is Christians have been too scared to talk about this, don't know why. But they should be pumping it out to their kids. Say, hey, it's a marvelous thing. God ordains it. I'm going to show you in Genesis here in a minute. Matter of fact, in the book of Song of Solomon, we see a lot of imagery, uh, garden Im imagery, hearkening back to the garden. Uh, it, this has been called the, the, the second garden of Eden. I think that's taken too far. Some people are like, they, their picture of Adam and Eve and, and blah, per, blah, 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 whatever. Okay. <laughs> In God's context, intimacy is a good thing. Uh, Romans 16, 19. I wanted to hit you out with this verse. It says, I was going to use this at the beginning. I don't know how it wound up way back here in my notes. Um, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Repeat after me. Okay. I didn't say K. <laughs> uh, wait, wait. Maybe i got to say it right. I don't want you corrupting it. Repeat after me. Repeat after me. Sex is good. In God's context. In God's context. Sex, is not evil Sex is not evil. In God's context. In God's context. In God, okay, you don't have to quote me. In God's context, intimacy is good. I want you to look at Genesis, okay? And, and oh, well, I'll tell you this after Genesis. Um, Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26 through 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Um, I get it, this is pre-fall, but this translates into after pre-fall, kill the snakes and the spiders. <laughs> Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You know what he's talking about there? Hate to say it. He's saying, hey, have sex. Right. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God sanctions it. In God's context, and what is this context? It's one man and one woman yes. for life. Yes, when, when your spouse dies, you're free. You can remarry. You're not in the law. I get that. You're saying, well, what about this? What about this? I can't deal with all of that. I'm just telling you, uh, well, I will say this. You say, well, what about this? What about this? Uh, what about people that remarry and all this? Um, they're going to have issues, okay? 
Does I'm not saying not to do it? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just letting you know there's always going to be issues. We live in a fallen world. But the way God intended it to be, and think about this. Isn't it interesting? I remember, <laughs> two things I remember. I remember going to camp once and Raleigh Campbell Jr. was there. I do not know what his message was, but I remember the illustration. He gets up there, and we didn't have PowerPoint back then. He had sheets of paper, and so he, he's holding up this paper, and it's an S, okay? And he, he goes like that real quick, and it spells out sex. And he, you know, so he's getting all the kids' attention, so he has their attention. And I'm like, I've thought back, and I'm like, what, what was his point on that? And I, I really don't know what his point was. I remember another sermon by Larry Jones, and, and, uh, I have no clue what his point was. I, I'm not kidding. He, but I'll tell you what he talked about. I do remember this. He was going on about, he kept talking about um, the primary function of, of sex is to have a baby. Okay? And, that, and you see that in Genesis, right? And I, but he really belabored the point on this, and, and I don't know what the deal was. However, I told you all that to say this. He's not wrong in the fact that um, that's what he communicates to them in Genesis. But isn't it interesting that in, in, among you know uh, people who want to have abortions, they want to have sex, but they don't want to have the baby. Um, that's satanic. That's satanic sacrifice. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Satan is all over that. He has to be. He has to be. And so... What we ought to be communicating to the kids is no. Well, first off, you're not an animal kid. People say, oh, the kids are going to do it anyway. Well, sure they are if they don't know Christ. If you know Christ, you know what it is possible. You can deny yourself. Let me ask you this. How many times this morning have you wanted to come up here and punch me in the face? But you haven't. You've shown restraint. You know what that means, boys and girls? You can show restraint. That's right. So... We should be pumping that out. Hey, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. Um, if he comes towards me, jump on him. Uh, then uh, we should be telling them, God, it's, it's okay. God's good. The world has corrupted it. In God's context, intimacy is good. Um, these You're going to want to write these verses down. Um to 16, 6, 3, 17. This is where she, she says over and over and over again, don't awaken love before it's time. Okay, um, She's communicating, hey, there's a time. One man and one woman in the context of marriage. One man and one woman in the context of marriage. Um, these verses, 2, 5, 4, 12, 8, 8 through 9. We see a faithful commitment. Okay, And by the way, we see that commitment even before the actual marriage. And so what do I mean by that? Well, I mean this, okay? Um, I, I, now, how can I say this? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're all going to, you're going to believe which one anyway. Um, you don't have to come tell me because I'm going to have to, I'm just going to have to be rude to you, okay? I think this is a serious thing that needs to be talked about. Uh, oh, you know what? I'll tell you what. If you have any questions or, or you don't like what I'm about to say, go see Emily Jackson. And, 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 and no, I'm being serious. And she will put you in your place over this. All right. Um, dating. People say, oh, we should date. We should date. It's worldly. Okay. And you say, oh, it's semantics. Dating, courtship. No. You know what? You know what dating usually leads to? Sex. And that's what, the world has a concept, and, and Satan counterfeits everything God does. Listen, if you have no plans on getting married, then don't see anybody. Right. I, I'm not kidding, okay? It should be, in, in a young person's head, listen, if you're going to be involved with somebody, I honestly, I have to tell you, I, I think the Jews did it right, okay? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily opposed to a, uh, arranged marriage. Of course, you can't let money exchange hands now. That'd be a little corrupt in our society. Um, but but uh, but the the concept of courting. You say that's so antiquated. Oh, isn't that just dating? No, it's not. 
Dating is like, ah, oh, we're just having fun, whatever. You go from one to the next to the next, and we wonder what our problem in society is and why there's no faithfulness. Yeah. Courting is this. Um, courting is, courting is, uh, well, let me do it the right way. Courting is this, okay? Um, Logan, Logan goes to, to Grace and Daryl, and he says, I would like to court your daughter, okay? Or he goes to Emily and says, I want to court you, okay? And so she's like, oh, okay. Well, guess what they both understand that means that they are on a path to getting married, okay? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they're engaged right then, but they both understand that's where we're going, okay? And so dating's not that way, all right? And so it's not semantics. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. The problem among... The, the problem with Christians is the reason they don't get this and it's, it's never going to take hold is because Christians are too, too, have too much of a hold. The world has too much of a hold on them. There, I said it. Um, but it's a big deal. But I guess what? Could you imagine? I want you to think about this, Andrew Kennedy. I want you to think about this. Can you imagine training Max up with that concept? And Max, when he gets old enough, and he's like, oh, Fiona, she's my love. She goes to Pete and, and, is, and is like, I'd like to court your daughter. And Fiona's like, no, I ain't having it. <laughs> so Max moves on to somebody else. But anyway, but can you imagine? But picture this. So he comes up with this concept. He enacts the concept. Not only is it a wonderful thing, but I tell you this. Can you imagine what that is going to do to the esteem of uh, whoever his bride is? It's going to make her just be like, whoa. It's going to be an amazing thing. Whereas whereas you compare it to dating, um, I can go on and on about it, and maybe someday I will. Okay. Um, but there's faithfulness even before the actual marriage and the implication the implication is this is this is it's not just everybody thinks oh it's the girl that means she dresses modestly and this and that and and just a uh, no never mind um but it goes for the the boy is faithful as well what does this mean he's not looking at pornography he's not he's not going to walmart to see what horrible things he can look at there um Y'all don't understand that reference. But, uh, huh? Um, all right, we're moving on. Okay, these are key verses. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read these key verses, but if you want to write them down, um, we've we've kind of went over them. We'll, we'll we'll go over the last one and because uh, I want I want you, I want you to see this. The, the, and then I have I'll leave you with our. Closing concept. Okay, in cha so in chapter eight, uh, verse five, it says, "Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. That there she brought thee forth that bare thee." All right, so I I believe I believe this is day eight. I believe they're 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 going uh, they're they're seeing her parents. Okay, um, that's just me. Some people don't think it's the parents; they think it's someone else. But the context suggests it's her family for a lot of reasons. Okay, and so this is a key verse: "Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death." Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have the most vehement flame. That is so powerful. Basically, it's saying their love is going to endure. Oh, one more thing. Back up on the whole dating thing. Uh, uh, let me tell you this. You want you want some guidelines, ladies? It's very simple. First Corinthians thirteen. Um, love thinketh no evil. Okay. Is the guy always thinking you're trying to see somebody else, um, or or are you that way? All right. It thinketh no evil. It's patient. It's kind. Run through these things, okay? Um, but but that verse six, 
It's saying, man, we're going to be together till the end. That's how powerful their love is. And so many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. A man will give all the substance of his house for love. It would utterly be uh, condemned. Um, okay, verse 8, we have a little sister. She hath no breast. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? Um, if this isn't, if, if this isn't, uh, if this isn't her family, then it's somebody else, and they're they're asking for advice um, about keeping her pure. At least that's what it that's what it seems like to me. Um, this vineyard they talk about, the basically it has to do with her brothers, and they're going to get uh, two hundred for dealing with it. Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions hearken to thy voice, cause me to hear it. So Solomon, he wants to hear her voice, he loves to hear it. So what she does is, she actually says, it, it's act, she's actually being playful, okay? And she's actually hearkening back to something else she's already said. Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or, or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. And so what we see there is, is their, their love is continuing. They still have that passion there and and it's okay it, if you're married it's okay you can say some spicy things to your wife there are some things you should not say i kid you not there was one pastor <sighs> he would counsel people i'm not kidding what i'm about to tell you it is horrendous and they were having issues and this pastor his philosophy was well, if you're having issues, it's because of sex. I mean, there's little his thought. And I now I don't know if this pastor had some issues. I suspect he did. But what he did is, he, well, first off, <laughs> it's so funny in counseling. Back in the day, it was the wife's, it was always the wife's fault. Okay. Well, that's flipped in counseling now. Now it's always the guy's fault. Okay. It rarely works out that way, by the way. But I find this interesting that it has flipped. But what he told them is, he said, he told the wife, he said, you, you need to talk rough. Like, he's telling her, you need to curse at your husband. Really? And I'm like, really? Don't. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. So we wonder why there's a problem. Oh, I know. Uh, uh, part of the clergy are the problem. Oh, Guess what we're going to find in Isaiah? A lot of debauchery. And guess where you, you, you think it was in the common people. But guess where it was? It was in the clergy. Okay. Well, my word, what do we think is going to happen there? Anyway, so I leave you with a key, this key concept. In God's context, intimacy is good. Kids, when can you have sex? When you're married. Yeah, when you're married. So what I need to tell you one more thing is this. Um, man, you need to be sure who you marry you need to if if you are not going the same way if they don't think like you marriage is such a serious thing yes it's good it's great everybody should get married um unless you're like paul and paul says hey you know uh if if you can then don't be married um but if you're going to burn he's talking about sexually then get married okay but the point is this matter of fact i did know somebody they kept moving up their wedding they kept moving up their wedding i'm like why why they want to have sex. I'm not kidding. It's literally what they said. And I'm like, okay, then why are you having a wedding? Just go low. Anyway, um, but marriage is so important that set your standards high. You hear me? And and you say, oh, people say they're too high. <laughs> no, I don't believe it. Okay? I don't believe it. I'll never buy it. And the reason is this. How awesome is God? Does God want to give you good things? Yeah. If, if I was a young person in this culture, I would be scared to get married. I'm not kidding. Um, I mean, I would be, I, I would take my time and I, and, and you don't have to be ashamed. Ask the hard questions. I'm not kidding. Uh, you can ask questions about pornography. You can ask, you can ask questions about wacky, you know, whatever wacky thing you think is going to happen. And yes, sure, there's a possibility they're going to lie to you. And you can't, by the way, you just can't rely on, oh, they go to church. Here, they're so much, so foolish. They went to church. Who cares? That doesn't matter. That means nothing. We need to see their home life. We need to see how they interact. 
with, with people, with their coworkers. So what am I saying? You need to take a little longer than six months. In God's context, intimacy is good. Please stand. Andrew.